Well, it's my pleasure on behalf of the Center for Studies in Higher Education to welcome you to the second of this year's Clark Kerr Lectures. I have uh, three things I'm going to do here out in front. The first is to issue you an invitation. There is, following this lecture, open to all, a uh, reception that will be held in Gallery C of this museum. Gallery C is not nearby. It is a matter of getting yourself back up to the uh, floor where you have the main entrance off of Bancroft Way, and then one level higher is where Gallery C is, but we will welcome you there, and there will be refreshments and food. Uh, secondly, uh, it is, of course, my opportunity to talk about these lectures and what they are and where they came from. I did some of that last week. I'll do less of it this week. But the lectures do recognize Clark Kerr and his importance to the University of California as both the first chancellor of the Berkeley campus and the president of the university during a particularly critical period. And they also recognize his long and uh, excellent service with the Carnegie Commission in various forms, putting out a very well-recognized series of books on higher education. Clark Kerr uh, came up with much of what we are today and led us very effectively there. So uh, the lecture series is sponsored by both the university itself and by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, thereby recognizing the two main dimensions of Clark Kerr's life. And we are pleased to have that, uh, that sponsorship. I then also have the pleasure of introducing, reintroducing this year's Kerr lecturer, who is Neil Smeltzer, our very own, and a university professor to boot in the UC system, extremely well known for his work on collective behavior, and believe me, those of us in, uni in the university are collective, so he's just the person to observe us and talk about us. Neil, I have to admit, attended Harvard University, and then went on to become a Rhodes Scholar in England, returned to Harvard for his PhD after that, and um, has been at Berkeley since 1958 with all kinds of functions. One of the earliest, if you read his most recent book, was to be called in immediately by the leadership of the Berkeley campus as they needed some thoughts on how to deal with the student unrest of 1964, and I'm sure Neil was of great value there and probably put to the test facing things in rapid fire order. Uh, so after beginning as assistant professor, his career went all the way through and has been at Berkeley except for a stint as director of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences located in a community somewhat to the south known as Stanford, California. <laughs> Uh, despite that, we admit uh, Neil with great pleasure to this lectureship and look forward to hearing his second lecture. Neil. Thank you, Judd. I'll say something about Stanford a little later. Um, well, thank you for coming. I hope I can uh, justify your efforts in coming here today. and I would like to just give a couple of minutes of uh, summary to what I spoke of last time. I basically was interested in the problem of growth in the university and uh, uh, identified a w number of ways in which the university grows and changes structurally, but I focused on a particular type of growth that is especially salient in uni universities and in higher education generally, and that is the phenomenon of what I called structural accretion. Uh, the addition of uh, structures and groups uh, to the same organization uh, progressively to make it more complex and more complicated, uh, but at the same time being very reluctant to shed any of these structures once they, once they uh, are put into place. And I try to give some of the preliminary reasons as to why this particular phenomenon is so important. It's a rather simple principle, but I've I'm actually organizing my lecture uh, around all the implications that I can think of of this particular kind of what you might call multiversity or multi-functional monster, depending on how you look at the university. 
Uh, and so what I was to do the last time was to describe this accretion pro process, to describe it historically, and then to trace out some of the early ramifications, the type of conflicts that are typically involved in this, in this pattern of, of growth. And um, then I analyze some of the peculiarities of a most important accretion, the academic department, and another one, the organized research institute. And then finally, I turn sequentially to the relation of accretion to the overloading of faculty roles, as well as the decline of the academic community, all associated with this general pattern of change. So what does all this add up to? I recently came across a phrase describing the modern American research university, and that phrase was, it is an agile elephant. And this is very colorful. It's also half true. It's agile, particularly in periods of growth, but it becomes a sort of stubborn or reluctant elephant in periods of stagnation or decline. Uh, different dynamics take over. In good times, taking advantage, building, taking on new personnel versus inertia, vested interests, infighting, and pruning and shaving. Now, what I'd like to do is to say that the process, one of the further implications of, uh, of this, uh, in, uh, this uh, accretion process is that it creates a, a, a sort of stable and inertial institution, which, however, is subjected to a lot of instabilities in its environment. And, it and there's a problem created by that because, it's, uh, because it is uh, reluctant as well as an agile uh, elephant. And so what I'd like to do initially is to identify three types of instabilities that, are, that they must contend with uh, and which create uh, adaptive problems uh, for the institution as a whole and for its leadership. The first type of inertial, uh, it, uh, the first type of instability is what I call the python goat problem. That is to say that the, the, the institution of higher education, like all institutions of education, uh, is geared to a certain part of the life cycle of a, of a population cohort. That's the goat when it responds. The python is the life cycle itself, and it must swallow this goat, and it moves progressively through the system, affecting it all. I mean, the most, most dramatic, of course, is the baby boom. The baby boom came along with a huge cohort after World War II, and this cohort proceeded to march through institutions associated with the life cycle and wreck them one at a time as it reached <laughs> As it reached, I mean, first the pediatric, uh, you know, pediatric industry, then the then the grade schools, and then the high schools, and then higher education, and then the midlife crisis uh, uh, therapists were ruined. Uh, then comes, uh, you know, retirement and funeral homes, and so on. All the way as this come, works its way through. This is a very dramatic phenomenon and it creates very big adjustive problems and it creates problems after it passes through. You see, the interesting thing is they only pass, they're only there for a few years. And then when the, in this case, the birth rate went down, the cohort shrank, and then you have a problem of excess capacity. It's so very important. And then one generation later, this baby boom created another baby boom because of the you know, echoing effect and then a third and so on. You get boomlets being created afterwards. These, the demographic ones are the most obvious and in a way the most difficult, but you also have goats that are produced by public policies. GI Bill was produced a, a certain great temporary expansion of, of uh, students. The Pell Grants are an interesting example of widening up the opportunities for people from, from uh, less privileged backgrounds. Affirmative action was a certain type of, of uh, public policy that created a demand for certain types of students to be admitted and all of these. Now when the, as I say, the <clears throat> period of uh, a big goat coming along is followed by a smaller demographic um, cohort plus hard times, then you really have a 
a difficult adaptive situation for these. The 70s were the, really the classic problem when, when everything tightened down and excess capacity was the name of the day. So that's one form of, uh, <coughs> of instability. The second is economic fluctuations in general. I mean, they go up and down, and, and uh, particularly for public institutions are very sensitive to these because they echo through the legislatures and cuts come along and you have to adapt accordingly. As a rule, these economic fluctuations are tougher on the publics than the privates, and they create a kind of cycle of, uh, a social psychological cycle as well that I've certainly observed uh, in my own uh, personal career. Uh, when the cycle's going down, you get a kind of gloom and uh, lowered morale and uh, sometimes scapegoating of people you think might be responsible. And then this is followed in very short order, in my experience, by a certain collective forgetting uh, and the return of uh, happy normality. Uh, I remember the mid-80s, the early 90s. Our current woes may be a little different than simple fluctuations we don't quite know. And I'll say more about the 2002 and 2008 phenomena as I go along. <clears throat> I should also mention in this respect fluctuations, but not necessarily cyclical, and those are political crises that affect institutions and also have a destabilizing effect uh, on them. Uh, I'm thinking of the 60s, the 70s, the South Africa, the student protests over fees. These impose costs on institutions. They tax the goodwill and credibility of institutions, and they increase administrators and trustees skittishness about public image and public reactions. Now in these uh, instabilities, you often tend to get a tendency towards centralization in the institution. And the reason why that is is that with these environmental impacts, the whole institution is affected and they have to be managed or responded to centrally. You don't get academic departments cutting their own budgets willfully and so on and so forth, that edges up toward the top. And certainly when a political crisis comes along, it becomes a system problem. And the, the, you sort of get authority excited at the higher levels during these periods of instability. And, but furthermore, once you get it excited there, it tends to stay there. There's a centralization by default, uh, either to follow up on the crisis or anticipate new crises or simply let it be lodged in the bureaucracy to which it went during the crisis. So this is a, a byproduct that's not often recognized, but is very real uh, in the system. The final uh, source of instability comes from the activities of competitors for the resources that come in the university's direction. Uh, in general, uh, the fortunes of higher education uh, are affected by military and welfare and other feder federal expenditures that are competitors for the, for the federal uh, pot of funds. Uh, especially relevant recently are states which have competitors from education, uh, K-12, welfare, health, and uh, notably correctional institutions, all of which put a demand on what's available to the states. There's a special vulnerability of higher education in this process of competition. It's a relatively weak political constituency in terms of numbers with, think of K-12, think of people who are worried about crime, think of all other constituencies that are larger and often more vocal and more urgent in their demands. And higher education is a relatively weak political constituency when you think of the whole spectrum. Also, there's a very interesting short-termism. Uh, it doesn't seem to matter in the short run if you cut education. I mean, the effects are not felt the same way that a garbage strike is felt the very next day. Uh, and so you can kind of cheat a little bit, if you will, and pretend that nothing's happening, whereas in the long run, the cultural and, political, uh, cultural and intellectual capital and skill level of the society can be devastated by this kind of neglect. But it doesn't happen tomorrow. It just is somewhere down the line and doesn't need to be thought of. Well, all of this is related to accretion. Because of past accretions, you have limited capacity to respond 
to these fluctuations and instabilities. Uh, furthermore, and we've seen this most recently, higher education is unusual in that it can often recoup temporary losses by simply raising the price of going to it. Now, you can't say that of prisons. And you can't say that of many welfare expenditures. And you can't, uh, uh, other competitors simply can't shrink in the same way or can't compensate for the, for the, for the cuts that they might receive. So they tend to be get inch toward, sometimes in reality and sometimes de facto, into entitlements for funds that higher education does not have. Those are the factors I'd like to uh, relate to this. And so what you get in, in higher education means uh, you have a limited capacity to respond and you, have to, and you respond tentatively in marginal ways. And tough times, tough times mean stubbornness, vested interest, jurisdictional fighting. In the mid-1980s, when I was active in the Academic Senate, David Saxon, this was, these were hard times, introduced an initiative and challenged the Senate to come up with policies for what he called transfer, consolidation, discontinuation, and disestablishment of units in the system. He presented this to the Senate. And the Senate began fighting over whether or not tenure was a campus problem or whether it was a system-wide problem. And that's what they fought about. There no policy about discontinuity. Nothing was even, ever even made manifest. It just was this kind of internal preoccupation took over. And, uh, and the whole thing was shelved, of course, when times got a little bit better. All talk of discontinuation just went out the window. <clears throat> so that's uh, my story on instabilities and more, more a story of the stubborn elephant than the, uh, than the uh, agile elephant. Now I'd like to spend, turn in a more political uh, direction in talking about the effects and uh, ramifications of this uh, increasing complexity. And I'd like to return to this idea of the growth of constituencies uh, in the institution and what that really means for it. Uh, constituencies can be either internal to the system or external, even though it's a little difficult to make that distinction. And they all get, and they, and internal consistency, uh, constituencies become, above all, more numerous and more complex. I mean, we get more specialized departments, colleges, professional schools, groups of faculty form, all with some at least latent political significance. Um, the student body has become more heterogeneous and also more group conscious, you might say, over time, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, of course, we have this enormous growth that I mentioned last time of ancillary personnel, TAs, uh, temporary appointments, research assistants, and this is also sometimes spilled over into unionization, which constitutes a very important constituency for a lot of institutions. Mm -hmm. You have a administrative support staff by unit and by total, and I've noticed that uh, de the development uh, development functions of institutions become a vested interest uh, very quickly, almost an, an autonomous unit on its own with its own jurisdictions, its own jealousies, its own uh, that accrue with it. You have groups of staff people, student services, housing, financial aid, medical care. You have admissions offices, human resources offices, mailing divisions, not very political, but they're still a group. Uh, and you have different political styles within all of these constituencies. You have rebels, you've got conformists, you've got activists, you've got anti-activists. So you have a real hive of internal uh, complexity and constituencies that, uh, that have to be contended with. <coughs> On top of this, you have uh, a, a explosion over time of external constituencies to the university some of which have been in existence a long time. I mean, the town and gown are as old as the medieval universities, for example, and, and the, with an ambivalent relationship toward the institutions. I mean, higher education brings uh, 
a college or university brings jobs, perhaps a little bit of prestige to the community. Same times it brings rowdy students. It brings an institution that takes up tax, takes up taxable land. It sometimes, uh, it sometimes, uh, sometimes engages in uh, uh, colleges and universities engage in research that are thought to be environmentally dangerous. There are all kinds of ambivalences about uh, about in the town. Uh, parents of students are an important constituency who uh, are very interested in the welfare of their students, even though in loco parentis is presumably dead. They don't like students to get into trouble when they're in college, and they don't welcome them coming home with, uh, with uh, bad grades, uh, arrest records, and uh, other things that, uh, that the university somehow or their college is thought to be res responsible if this might happen. Alumni and uh, others who are loyal to the institution, another very major constituency, um, they tend to romanticize the uh, institution that they went to or how they remembered they went to uh, and are very sentimental about it, but at the same time, they, uh, they're often politically conservative uh, because that's how they remember the institution. They don't want it to change. Uh, Robert Hutchins uh, said that alumni play a weird and often terrifying role. <laughs> and he said they're the most reactionary element in the constituencies. Kerr also mentioned the conservatism of uh, alumni in his own work. Then you have the long-standing economic interests, agricultural, business, medicine, all of whom have an interest in what universities do. You have a traditional subgroup that is interested in, in universities and uh, especially in the eccentricities and scandals of, the, uh, of academic life, life swapping, so on. Uh, this is the groves of academe set, you might call it, largely innocent, but nonetheless in the, it's out there. Uh, and then you have a, a constituency that's called the public that is often referred to. I mean, this has been a continuous story in my own wanderings through administrative circles is the public is often mentioned. Will this fly with the public? What will the public think of this? Without specifying what the public is. I mean, it could be a few legislators. It could be a mass movement. It could be a community. It could be whatever. But it nonetheless is a very powerful a reference point in people's thinking, and sometimes more powerful because it's imagined rather than real. And when you're imagining something, the limits on imagination, of course, are much less than they are on actual perception. So you just cannot uh, dismiss this uh, image of the public as a very important constituency, even though it's very hard to put your finger on it. <clears throat> I should go on and mention uh, legislatures, executive state officials, governing boards, all of which have their own expectations and their policies and power over the institution. Private donors, in principle, they are thought of being probably somewhat weak because we have a long tradition of not interfering once you give a gift to the institution, but that's, that's, that's not true. All donors give to institutions because they like to see something happen in an institution, and these constitute constraints. When I was director of that uh, uh, center uh, south of here, um, I noticed a kind of constant tension. One pole was the desire to do, have complete discretion over money that came in. That was my position. But on the other hand, every government and donors and, uh, and, corp and foundations all had some kind of agenda. So it was a constant negotiation, a kind of tug of war of how you define the uses of what was coming in. And this is, of course, the story of any institution of higher education. Philanthropic foundations, very important uh, constituencies, and not always so much in direct pressure and supervision or intervention in research, but they provide an opportunity factor. They're one of these external agencies that can be described as a kind of pigs to the trough phenomenon. That is, they offer money and then people go for that money. There's a kind of diverting or distorting effect on the activities of the institution because of opportunities provided by, I mentioned also the federal government. There are a lot of restrictions on how much the federal government can influence uh, institutions. And those are, to my mind, admirable. But at the same time, 
<clears throat> there are two major impacts that have to be taken into account. One is, if an institution is interested in receiving government search funds, they have to create a sizable infrastructure for asking for them and accounting for them uh, <clears throat> once they're given. And this is, the, your, this is your, your sponsored research offices and so on and so forth, and clerical and administrative help in preparing grants and so on, that whole thing. But secondly, and more important, is that when federal research funds are received, this means you have to conform to federal laws and policies as an institution. And of course, this is, and, and this, this was a feature of affirmative action. You have the health concerns, you have security concerns, you have uh, animal rights, you have safety of subjects, you have environmental concerns, all of which come to be obligations on the part of the institution for which they must pay. That is to locate the problems and then to fix them. They all become university or college expenditures. These have been called in a very accurate phrase, unfunded mandates. Things you have to do but which you don't get paid to do and they accumulate in, and they're a big, big feature, not only economic but political in the fortunes of institutions. And closely related, you have all kinds of social movements that are interested in the fate of the university. <coughs> Environmental, animal rights, the usual ones who operate directly in influencing the university, sometimes direct political action and demonstrations, but certainly uh, uh, constituencies that administrators are well advised to take account of uh, in their own life. Finally, I mentioned the role of the media, which has changed over time. Uh, a couple of my colleagues in, decades ago wrote an article called The Social Functions of Ignorance. And what, the, and, it, and what I get from that is if people don't know what you're doing, you're a lot freer to do what you want to do. And I think in the, once upon a time, Colleges and universities were kind of this, regarded as serene, innocent, well-meaning places about which you didn't ask too many questions, and they did good things for your children, and so on. And they're not, not really much of a active, interfering kind of concern. But that has changed, and the media has played a big role in it. Possibly because uh, the growth of size and influence of universities and colleges, perhaps scandals, conflicts, crises and the rise of more interested constituencies. These more publicly visible institutions, particularly prestigious institutions, are more publicly visible and more politically vulnerable. Um, good copy is made for press and TV by demonstrations, uh, administrative perks, research ethics breaches, and so on. In the 1960s, when we were under, uh, under great political pressure, I used to uh, Tease, uh, Richard Hafner and uh, Ray Kolvig that uh, theirs was the only office in the country, public relations office in the country, whose prime motive was to keep the university out of the news. <laughs> and it sort of was. <laughs> or at least have some effect on the news. <laughs> no, you, should, you should ask a question, Ray, later. <laughs> anyway, these all are, this is a, I painted a complex picture because it is complex and it's, it's really the, the environment in which the institution swims uh, as, a, as a public or a private institution even. <clears throat> this of course creates immediate problems for the administration and governance of the institution, of that political scene that's created by these constituencies. In my review of the, uh, of the review on uh, management of higher education these days, I've been, it's a highly emotional and highly written about subject. It's, uh, and I've been a, a, able to identify several different views in the literature about contemporary management of colleges and universities. The first is a kind of positive one. They, they take the... <coughs> They take the administration as a legitimate, even central goal, and develop guidelines for how you handle, how you handle things uh, uh, under these complex circumstances. And you come across titles 
the Higher Education Manager's Handbook, Corporate Management Strategies. There's a big market and there's a subclass uh, that is subclass of literature that parallels mar uh, hospital administration and above, above all, business administration. And these uh, take administration as a key function and they give <coughs> its goals, principles, guidelines, maxims, strategies, and tips as to how to, how to manage the institution. It's, it's very similar to the corporate literature on this matter. Now there's an, a negative side of this that also appears that they realize that this big management and new administrative problems are here, but it's corrupting to the institution. Again, titles will tell you something. The McDonaldization of Higher Education. Academic Capitalism. Higher Education Incorporated. These are all real titles, real books, and I can give you dozens of such titles that's coming out, all of which uh, prove that there's a market for dread and gloom as well as uh, practical tips in this brave new world. There's a third uh, literature that is also negative, which emphasizes administrative creep and sprawl and corruption. It's sort of a Parkinsonian uh, a version of administration administrative bloat. Here, an uh, example of the title is Ginberg, The Fall of the Faculty, Rise of the All-Administrative University, and Why It Matters. And they're just store, horror stories filling this book of power grabs, meetings that are now unnecessary, conferences, planning, image polishing, administrative shirking, squandering, corruption, theft, and insider deals. These are all words from that book as to what administration has become. It's a quite conspiratorial uh, approach and I don't really believe it, but there it is. My own view, of course, I've been developing is that there's been these vast structural changes that have affected the, the institution and it really is a, it really is a, <clears throat> a thing you ought to expect, uh, I mean, you don't deny administrative bloat and vested interest in administration any more than you do not deny them anywhere else. But nonetheless, I've taken a somewhat more, <clears throat> you might say, historical and perhaps more neutral view than these different uh, special views. But nonetheless, you have to take into account this increased and uh, increasing role of constituencies. Um, I think the chancellor mentioned uh, that uh, one of my essays that appeared in a recent publication was called Surprises at Berkeley. And I really meant political surprises. And I re in this paper, I analyzed 40 years of unanticipated crises, if you will, in the university. And <coughs> I defined a surprise as an event or situation that relies in relation to a context of groups that have explicit or implicit expectations about how the university should be conducting itself. In other words, I brought these constituencies right into the center of understanding the political difficulties, crises, problems that universities think. If you keep this in mind, then you get some intelligible understanding of what appears also in the administrative literature about what the new administration is, as opposed to some traditional model of college administration. First of all, the claims are more contradictory because there are more constituencies who have an interest or stakeholders who have an interest in what you're doing. Administration is more difficult because of size, complexity, and having to do with so many things to, for so many people. Surveys show that administrators spend most of their time in crisis management and juggling and crisis prevention and very little in the intellectual aspects of the institution. And there's also a pressure to continuously kind of tiptoe through the tulips or uh, be a little passive in exactly what you're going to say or represent yourself as because there's so many buys out there 
or toes to be stepped on, whatever your analogy is, there are just a lot of them, and it makes for a certain <coughs> timidity. I call this institutional timidity, not necessarily personal timidity on the part of leaders, but it's structured that you, you're, you're, you, you play it safer if you're uh, quiet or you say nothing or you say perhaps sweet nothings. Closer related, there's a great deal of complaint about the end of the great leaders, the end of the great presidents, Eliot and Brewster and even Kerr. These, are, these, are not, these people are not around anymore, it is claimed, uh, because vision, being visionary is, is dangerous. Because someone's going to object to the vision that you enunciate, at least someone, maybe many. And so consequently, I don't attribute these kinds of changes to the personalities of leaders, but there's this the structural setting is such that it brings out a greater uh, kind of uh, caution and timidity. And I also relate it to the shortened tenure of college, pres pres college university presidents because over that's a trend over time. This is because they're more vulnerable and they can get into more trouble faster than ever before. This, the this is a, a kind of unfortunate uh, interpretation, but I believe it has some, some merit. On this count, I'd like to say something about shared governance with faculty. Uh, it is still proclaimed as a sacred uh, principle, by, especially by faculty, uh, and is also thought to be in a state of decline. And I accept both these implications, and I sort of note the following reasons. You get de declining numbers of participants. You get repeated faces in, in academic senate. You get the old hands. That has been a long-term problem, but I think it's gotten more, more severe. Uh, with greater accretion, you get a greater attraction of other things than being a community member of your own institution. The outward orientation of faculty and the decline of institutional loyalty is a very important factor. The administration has become more complex and more autonomous, and the fact that four administrators who are full-time and often under heavy pressure to consult with yet another constituency, as a matter of course, is a nuisance. Senate governance is a voluntary army, unpaid, and there's many other distractions which are more rewarding uh, and, and, uh, and more attractive. Finally, because of the academic calendar and the academic commitments of people in uh, uh, state governance operates at a very glacial, uh, Senate governance operates at a glacial pace, I mean of meetings and not meeting in the summer and breaks and travel and schedules. And if we, I would joke with uh, service personnel in the institution that we really want to drive them crazy. We put them in charge of scheduling meetings. And that is absolutely true uh, in the academic senate. So all these are matters of creep. And basically, we have a situation in which nobody wants to touch the problem of the inefficiency or the difficulties of senate administration. First of all, there you got this heritage of shared governance as a sacred principle on the part of many, many faculty. Secondly, because of that, administrators are very hesitant to step in this minefield and take initiative in improving. I mean, who asks for faculty opposition uh, on initiative to change things? It's just a minefield, uh, and <coughs> intelligent administrators know it. I don't know of any way to improve the uh, involvement of faculty and streamline it except from an honest confrontation uh, from both sides of this area which is kind of taboo uh, for in, from the standpoint of reform because there are so few people who are motivated to reform it responsibly and so many ways to get into trouble if you try to reform it. Seems to me that you simply have to have it. Here's a place for openness and honesty and mutual, mutual uh, discussion of what's working and what's not working just simply has to be done and a mutual responsibility for reform. Okay, now, I'd like to talk about accretion continuously and talk about its relation to academic stratification. Point number one is a general point. 
Academics lead the world in ranking things. They're wonderfully inventive in producing unequal categories. Perhaps the most accomplished institution in the entire world. Maybe the State Department is equally good, but we're not sure. The principle is, you name it, we will rank it. And uh, one commentator said, <clears throat> one of the striking features of academic life is that nearly everything is graded in more or less subtle ways. This has an ironic side because so many advocates and defenders of higher education point to its healthy influence on democracy uh, in society, where it itself is so highly stratified and ranked, it's uh, baffling. I mean, it's an endemic tendency. I'll just spend a little time on how we rank things. Within the professorial ranks, we have acting assistant, assistant, associate, with and without tenure, full professor, supplement, supplemented by chairs, above scale appointments, a status spectrum extending from apprenticeship to super galactic eminence. Stars rank higher than Deadwood. Faculty who give essay exams look down their noses at the multiple choice crowd. Some faculty in mainstream departments look down on those who teach in physical education, ethnic studies, gay and lesbian studies, women's studies. Some faculty members in liberal arts look down on their professional school colleagues for not being truly academic, but some are other vocational. Within departments, <clears throat> well, medical schools, law schools ask for separate salary schedules, which have symbolic significance for status, <clears throat> creating new ranks. Individual faculty in departments strive for different kinds of advantage, rank, salary, relief from committee assignments, size of teaching load, graduate versus undergraduate teaching, none of which are exclusively status symbols, but they symbolize status as to the degree you get involved in these. Even within the ranks of this non-tenured faculty, which I'm going to talk about at length in the third lecture, <clears throat> you have status distinctions between full-time and part-time appointees, those who give four-credit courses and those who give non-credit courses, and those giving transfer courses over those giving vocational status courses. Ranks, ranks, ranks <clears throat> of worthiness and contribution and general status. <clears throat> Ranking systems simply set the stage for struggles for legitimacy and prestige in institutions. <clears throat> well, now, I'd like to talk about stratification in three more specific contexts. Stratification among institutions, we get into rankings here, among whole institutions. Uh, stratification among uh, uh, stratification and competition in multi campus systems. And third, stratification, prestige among disciplines. <clears throat> of course, so we have <clears throat> striving for a prestige and reputation as a hallmark of institutions going all the way back for more than a century and becoming increasingly sophisticated with the National Research Council rankings that come out from time to time. And this has also become a feature of international ranking with the uh, Haotong University in Shanghai and the Times Education Supplement being two of the main international ranking. Administra uh, features <clears throat> of this ranking are the following. Administrators are keenly aware and ambivalent about ranking systems. Uh, it has been said that once a ranking comes out, 20% of the colleges and universities throw a cocktail party and 80% attack the methodology. <laughs> the, the reason that these are so important is that they yield a certain measure in an extremely ambiguous field, ambiguous and important field uh, of, of the colleges and universities hold the fortunes of young people, they're the center of all this prestige, and that 
So these simplified symbols, ranks, numerical ranks, become reality, and reality become, that reality becomes the object of ambivalence. I'll tell you a story. I went to Santa Cruz in the middle of my academic career here on a, headed up a committee to uh, evaluate the Department of Sociology. That, these are, happens all the time. And uh, I was talking with the assembled faculty in part of, the, part of the investigation, part of the review. And one person in the audience said, where does Santa Cruz rank nationally in sociology? Direct question to me. I refused to answer and started, it went on, but it wouldn't stop. Other people began posing the same question and increasingly uh, warmly. And it became, uh, they, they, pretty soon that was the only thing that was being talked about. Where does Santa Cruz write, Frank? So I finally, very reluctantly, I gave an answer. I said it would be difficult to say that it ranks in the top three dozen departments in the country. I thought this was a honest, possibly even generous uh, <laughs> comment at the, at the time. But that created a riot that I had said three dozen. I mean, there people. So I nearly got driven from the campus for not answering, and then nearly got driven from the campus for answering. That's how salient this sort of thing was in that particular, that particular group. Well, it is in people's mind. Another set of feature is the methodological problems that, are, that hound it. I mean, most, uh, <clears throat> most uh, measures are by evaluation of peers, of the excellence of research, and the excellence of graduate training. And this is a limited, uh, this is obviously not a complete or methodologically adequate way to do it. And uh, <clears throat> different measures will yield different outcomes. There was a slight change in the methodology of the uh, Times uh, Higher Education Supplement, that is the measure on which the rankings were put out, and at that moment, Stanford fell from ninth to 16th in the rankings. Now, I did not object personally to this change, <laughs> but I knew it was methodologically, it was a methodological artifact of the way that they, they had done it, and they even other institutions were even more radically affected by this. <clears throat> but in any event, you have uh, <clears throat> subcategories of institutions that are Ivies and uh, that, that compare each other all the time. They look at one another all the time and they're looking at these ranks and how we're going to get the ranks up next year, so on and so forth. It's a kind of endemic kind of almost concern. And the problem is, is that these rankings are very stable over time. They don't change much. I mean, you get, you get Northwesterns, you get UC San Diego, you get Stanford. Uh, you get uh, Clark University and you get Johns Hopkins. Over time, you get changes in these institutions and their ranking, but very little. And very, any given year, they're much the same. <clears throat> but this does not. But this does not seem to affect the wannabes who are always figuring out some way to move up another few notches in the rankings, and it, nor the established places that want to keep their keep their place at the top. Another, finally, relation to accretion, the, the ranking system is in large part a, fu a function of the differential ability of excellent institutions to gain more resources from outside. In all these areas, the selective decision of foundations, federal governments, private donors, and corporate co cooperators is to look for the best, and they go to the best, and everything gets concentrated in the top 20, 25 institutions of the country by virtue of the very high motives that these groups have, they want their money to pay off, so they go to the good places. So you get a, a, a really sort of heady uh, <clears throat> heady competition that is so deeply ingrained that it's, it, uh, it will stay and it will continue to be regarded with the highest ambivalence throughout the system. Uh, Mr. Moderator, do I have time for two more points before the question period? Uh, rankings and competitions in multi-campus systems is an interesting topic to me. 
Uh, Multi-campus systems, of course, are a post-World War II phenomenon, and they, they were the preferred, uh, preferred uh, coordinative answer to a great deal of growth among campuses and the inability and the competition among campuses for, uh, for resources and the uh, unmanageability by the legislature of large state systems. So you developed a model of multi-campus systems. It's organizationally sensible to coordinate the, the system in some way other than rampant politics. And so multi-campus systems, in a way, are, a, are a, I thought, an, what, a, a very necessary system, <clears throat> necessary adaptation. Uh, and uh, particularly if we do not, uh, uh, the model of the University of Rome, of its hundreds of thousands of students, is not one that we have taken to. Uh, we set upper limits, usually, sometimes very high, but they're upper limits, and consequently, you get proliferation of institutions, all of which are in some way in competition for the same resources. <clears throat> I'm especially interested in the competitive relations within systems. Sometimes system-wide uh, organizations uh, such as Texas and New York include the whole gamut, community colleges all the way up to the universities. And in some sense, competition is diminished in this kind of setting because they can't Junior colleges can't say we're going to give a PhD and so on and so forth. Whereas here in California, we invented three system-wide organizations, all of which can name cognate institutions, the three levels of segments. Uh, this changes the parameters of competition. A certain amount of competition takes place within the uh, system-wide, and uh, <coughs> and there's. And there's a new kind of reference point in a relative deprivation and a relative advantage of institutions. Uh, flagship institutions uh, tend to uh, stress uh, excellence in their demand for resources. Lesser, newer institutions emphasize equity and being in the common system. Uh, Jack Peltison once is reported to have said, he was the chancellor of Irvine, and he said, uh, when Chuck Young, that's the chancellor of UCLA, when Chuck Young has a lollipop, I want the very same lollipop. <laughs> kind of the personalization of a very widespread principle of competition in system wide. And and furthermore, this is one more source of accretion, if I may add it. That is to say, colleges are forever asking for new programs, new doctorals, new, new things in order to <clears throat> enhance their own competitive and, and uh, their status. <clears throat> okay, now move on to prestige among disciplines, and then I will turn it over for questions. This works out at campus levels, of course, uh, inst departments and disciplines proclaiming their own importance and their own uh, <coughs> their excellence and the audience is usually administrators who are preparing budgets. Uh, the, uh, there's a great competition in learned societies like the National Academy of Sciences as the relative position that different disciplines have in terms of members, in terms of age and prestige and so on and so forth. Uh, one time I sat on a committee in the National Academy of Sciences to re-examine the categorization of, of disciplines. Like neuroscience wasn't recognized, and it probably should be, because it was just newer, right? And this, this was a major scene of warfare. Just simply to, just the tiniest little alter, alteration of the position or prestige, or even the name of it, created great wars. Uh, this, and this committee did a few things, but it was really under heavy barrage from representatives of different disciplines as not to lose their status or to, or to gain status. <clears throat> different subfields of, uh, of the disciplines also uh, rank. Uh, Lord uh, Rutherford uh, said, uh, in the sciences, there, are, there is uh, physics, and then the rest is collecting postage stamps. <laughs> Social sciences are always looking at each other as to how scientific they are. 
and ranking and drawing invidious distinctions, being defensive, so on. But what I'd like to close with is a, a bit of a discussion of, uh, of departments that have really uh, suffered in both uh, power, prestige, and income, and those were the humanities in the past uh, uh, 50, 60 years. It's, it's really the effect of accretion that I have in mind, that is to say the, the money flowing to institutions has flowed uh, really to the, to the sciences and to some extent a lot of the professional schools, medicine and business, uh, computer studies, the social sciences, this all began with Van Iver Bush with Sputnik and the, and the proliferation that has continued ever since. Social sciences are in the middle. They receive some spillover from the federal initiatives, in, uh, but very small compared with the physical and biological sciences and engineering. Uh, and the uh, humanities were neglected by all dimensions with respect to the largesse from outsides, with some notable exceptions like the, uh, well, you have the uh, National Endowment for the Arts and for the Humanities, which is very small, very controversial. And you have some foundations like Mellon who've picked the humanities out as special targets. But as a rule, the, so, uh, the, what you have is a great internal differentiation with regard to salary levels, summer salaries, perks, travel funds, and campus power leaning toward the sciences as a long-term development. And this has meant a <coughs> partial marginalization of the social sciences and a major marginalization of uh, the humanities. Humanities have also declined in student demand, which just simply adds to, the, adds to the problem. The natural sciences are gorged, social sciences are fed, humanities are starved. That's the way it is. There's a great deal of talk of the crisis of the humanities as a global crisis. And I see the merit of the complaint because there is, in fact, with the withering of humanities, a threat to the idea of what a university is all about, that is to cover the world of knowledge. And this is being seriously compromised by the institutional and financial and political events of the last half century. <clears throat> this spills over, in my final point, this spills over, this crisis of humanity, I believe, spills over into university politics. Even in 1963, Clark Kerr, in his Uses of the University, uttered a simple little slogan. Scientists affluent, humanists militant. That is to say, the natural embitterness that accumulates with the being driven towards second-class citizenship with respect to almost all the, uh, all the resources and perks of university life. Now, I'll finish with, a, with a, my own interpretation of an intellectual development that influenced the humanities most, and this was a general movement uh, known under the headings of postmodernism and deconstructionism that took over big time in, uh, in the 80s. And uh, what I'd like to suggest in a bit of sociology of knowledge, if you will, uh, the fact that one of the ingredients of construct deconstructionism and postmodernism was its anti-scientific import. That is to say, sciences, the emphasis on essentialism. Science essentializes the world in artificial ways artificial in a way that really, knowledge is really organized according to power groups and according to capacity of people to enforce their definitions of knowledge, and essentialism is a mistake. In other words, it's a sort of serious attack on reality as we understand it. Uh, you've probably heard the two jokes, one about the postmodernist who, or the deconstructionist who refused to get his car fixed because a carburetor malfunction was a social construction and the second, the more serious, the one who, postmodernist who threw himself out of the 30, 30th floor window to demonstrate that gravity was a mere construction. <laughs> Postmodernism spread through the humanities and not, not further. Let's say it had its biggest impact in language studies, in English, in history. Uh, and uh, it also, in the social sciences, it, uh, it spread into those areas that were regarded as soft, 
cultural anthropology, uh, for example, uh, history of science, some gender studies to some degree, uh, and, but not in the sciences or not in the science-minded social sciences. I mean, economists probably never heard of it, and if they did, they'd, uh, they'd probably dismiss it as, as uh, anti-positivist nonsense, as would most scientists. Uh, humanists didn't help with this because the language of postmodernism and, and deconstructionism is extremely obscure. Uh, you have heard of the, uh, what you get when you combine a postmodernist with a mafia. You get an offer you cannot understand. <laughs> well, I think I'll conclude with this point, saying that uh, deconstructionism I take as a, an intellectual movement that has to be judged on its, its own terms. Um, and I myself believe it will be a rather minor footnote in, in the history of knowledge, but that's just my opinion. On the other hand, I think one can also throw some light on the particular spread and, and virulence of the movement by looking at the larger institutional context in which it, it developed. With that, I'll stop. I think I've gone on too long and entertain questions. There are some ground rules for the question period. Uh, and they stem from the fact that we are, in fact, being taped. And you may watch these lectures again and again and again <laughs> on UCTV uh, or YouTube, if you know the right address. But the link will be on the page that announces these lectures on the Center for Studies in Higher Education website. You can probably Google them, too. Because of that, when you ask your question, wait for the arrival of the microphone that is being brought to you so that your question will be recorded and audible to people who are watching the tapes. And with some caution and trepidation, I will urge the speaker to stay close to this. No, no, I've got oh, you have your I've own. Got Very got good. Got real <laughs> OK, so questions are in order. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, what, do, what do you think of operational excellence, and what are some of its potential effects? Uh, please tell me what you have in mind. A movement, operational excellence? Uh, the consulting program? The, the what? The program that the consultants came up with to increase efficiency on campus? I'm afraid that uh, I didn't know it by that name, and I will confess full ignorance on exactly what it, what it refers to. It, it, it seems to be in the, in the general category of the uh, uh, managerial, uh, managerial rationalization uh, of it. Uh, uh, and please pardon me because I am ignorant on the details. Here are two questions down here. Thank you. Uh, last time, when asked about the ranking systems, you said they were mischievous. Today, in your talk, they seem more innocuous. Basically, nothing much has changed over time, uh, and the schools who are high seem to be the same, most of all. But what about the international effect of this? Isn't that one difference that they're now global rather than national? Yes, I'll comment on that. And I'm, I'm sorry if I, if I seem to be taking two different uh, attitudes toward it. I still regard them as, as mischievous in that they are, uh, they are extremely diversionary with respect to the uh, interests of, uh, of uh, not only departments, but also whole institutions. Uh, uh, I once went on an, one of these other review committees for a department at the University of, of Iowa and talked to, extensively to faculty and administrators in that institution. And all I got was this view toward Madison and its view toward Ann Arbor. As though, uh, you know, with the right kind of strategies and the right kind of appointments and the right kind of this and that and the other thing, we're going to inch up toward those uh, biggies. And in the, in the, I consider this to be somewhat of a misplacement of energy. In addition, the criteria for ranking tend to devolve into kind of automatic 
measures of numbers of articles published in what kinds of institutions. Journals are ranked in the same way uh, as to what contributes to the faculty members' excellence. Uh, rankings get associated with how much external money you can bring in. Another visit to the University of Oklahoma, looking at the, exactly the faculty members who get grants and those who don't as being a, a, an object of fixation. I call that mischievous when you get these kinds of criteria. Now, the international side, um, our comment on the general impact of these international uh, rankings, uh, <clears throat> there are many of them. Those two that I mentioned are only one of, of uh, what to, to say, a dozen system of German and others that uh, rank institutions. And <clears throat> one can ask, well, what's the point? Why, why take an interest when these are so qualitatively different institutions and different settings, uh, levels of development, newness, and so on. Why reduce the whole thing to some kind of one through 400 uh, institutions? It's just a, an artificial uh, creation and becomes more artificial when it becomes international because you get a multiplicity of cultures and a multiplicity of systems involved, increases the inaccuracy of any credibility that you might put in the system. So uh, these are a series of answers to your to your question. It's not complete for sure, but they do respond, I believe. George. Um, Henry Kissinger came up with this clever put down that academic politics are so vicious because so little is at stake. Yes. Um, and when I think of the, the points you were making today about obsessive stratification uh, within, nested within stratifications, uh, when I think of the resistance to disestablishment that has been one of your major themes, when I think of your comments on the obsession for ranking uh, systems external to the university, um, uh, I wonder whether you uh, find yourself more in agreement than disagreement with Kissinger's quip. Well, I can, I can uh, give you an independent quip which is my own, <clears throat> and, I, and that is that the only two institutions that are more vicious in their politics are monasteries <laughs> and psychoanalytic institutes. <laughs> I've never spent time in a monastery, but I can testify to the truth of psychoanalytic institutes. Even among highly analyzed people, you know, there's unbelievable preoccupation with tiny symbols and status and so on and put downs and it's really, and universities are much the same way. And I also tied it directly in my own thinking. I did not know the Kissinger quip, but it's absolutely uh, in, is it coincident with mine that the, 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 the organizations with real power, like the United States Senate, are not really so plagued with this kind of what symbolism really is what, what, it, what it is. Uh, and uh, of course, academics are dealers with symbols. That's their, that's their strong suit. That's what, we deal, that's what we deal with, culture. We are cultural institutions. And I, I have a more general feeling that cultural institutions have this kind of pettiness, kind of invidious, invidiousness. Uh, and uh, I think that the lack of power feeds into that, most of its status. Yes, Paula. I'd like to push you a little bit more about some of the consequences of these accretions. Towards the end of your lecture, you talked about the humanities being displaced from places of power at the university, for example. Yes. And there are others as well. I mean, you've been talking in a fairly neutral way about Thank this development. <laughs> but in fact, all of us sitting here know that there are major consequences, some of them quite negative, as in I would interpret the displacement of the humanities as highly negative. So I'd like to press you on some of the things that you would that you think, uh, in addition to the the receding of the humanities, has taken place in the institution of the university over the last 20 years, 25 years. A longer ago. list of negative consequences. Yes. I'm going to give. Uh, in the next lecture, a, uh, an analysis or an assessment of a, 
whole series of diverse effects of what have been called commercialization uh, with respect to the with respect to student consumerism, with respect to the collaboration with uh, industry, with respect to the preoccupations with budget and managing the shop. Uh, if you look at the literature, I've noticed this bifurcation of opinions in, uh, into the uh, Pangloss and uh, Cassandra mode in the literature. But, uh, and uh, my effort, I will, will th these are the areas in which I turn to when looking for additional consequences other than uh, the ones I began to talk about today with respect to different academic uh, uh, disciplines. I suppose this constitutes a uh, warm invitation to come to the next lecture. Uh, Thank you. You lay yourself open, of course, by asking for questions when the lectures aren't complete. Well, but you see, I, I, there's, a, there's a point I'd like to make, Paula, here, is that my whole intent in preparing these lectures was to try to achieve some kind of balance in an unbalanced world. That is so much of the, so much of the commentary, as I, this is what I did talk about, about our institutions is highly charged, highly, highly crisis-ridden uh, or uh, uh, hand-wringing and, and so on, not all of which is accompanied by much analysis at all. So my, uh, I guess I would, uh, I, if you ask me to make it public, I suppose the main impulse in my own thinking is to kind of assess this within uh, some kind of uh, both institutional as well as political as well as intellectual context. And so I don't, I don't see this, this history of banging the university about, of complaining about how it's dying, about how it's, uh, or how it's conquering the world, all of this is not new. I mean, it's really associated with at least 150 years of our own history. So you, that forces you to take a little bit of distance from it because of all the untrue predictions that have been made, because of all the, all the hopes that have not been realized and those who have and so on. So there's my personal confessional that you excited. <laughs> yes, Betty Lou? Cut, wait for the mic. Here's, a, here's one right here. Oh, another mic over there, okay. Well, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on what you were already talking about. I missed the first lecture, so I don't know. I sort of missed you talking about sort of the miracle of higher education institutions. The what? The miracle of how alive they are in terms of the fact that people still care about them because something happens in them with regard to knowledge, ideas, exchange, contributions to policy, contributions to thinking, in how we understand ourselves, all those things that make people, besides getting a degree, care about these institutions and what they mean in, in um, in the world as well as in our own society. No, I regard this as a kind of a paradox. I agree all fully with the uh, wonders and the accomplishments of the institutions, uh, hailed worldwide as the leader and the best, uh, even though reviled at home uh, very much. I was once a member of the, member of the um, uh, outfit called the German American Academic Council, made up of academics and uh, administrators and a few politicians from Germany and the United States. We met maybe three times a year. It was meant to be an affirmation of common interests and academic counsel. And uh, we talked about all kinds of things. And a theme emerged that I observed is that the German scholars had this unbelievable admiration for American uh, higher academic system. And uh, the Americans sat around blasting the American higher ed education. <laughs> System. So there was a dialogue of the deaf here. Uh, and it's that paradox is, is absolutely enormous consequence by regard to its comp uh, of its accomplishments, all of which you, you mentioned. At the same time, a subject of enormous ambivalence. This is one of the problems that really is, informs the, what, I, what I've been saying and will say. <clears throat> and uh, the interesting thing is, when I would ask, the, well, it would come out, I didn't have to ask. What is it about the American system that you like? Competition. This was the German view, and of course, they were reflecting the heavy hand of the state, the inability of faculty members to raise their salaries by more than one and a half percent by moving from one institution to another, 
the ever-present uh, managerial uh, intrusion at all levels in their own society. So they were speaking as much about themselves because the Americans were kind of uh, knocking their own system for its cutthroat quality. So there you go. This is a paradox, I would put. Not that I deny those accomplishments, but put them in the context of, uh, of the crazy politics of our society and institution. Yes? You mentioned in your talk that in times of fiscal crisis like now, there is a tendency within universities to go towards centralization as a way of dealing with it. Don't you think, however, that at least at the University of California in this crisis, there has been at least a movement towards decentralization? And for evidence, I would cite the recent proposal from the chancellor of UC San Francisco to um, loosen her ties with, or the campus's ties with the University of California uh, for what sound a lot like market-based reasons that they pay more into the system than they get out of it. And do you think this is or is not different from other crises at other times? Uh, they, uh, I followed that uh, UC uh, San Francisco proposal with great interest for obvious reasons. Uh, I think it might lie on a slightly different level, uh, and I'll elaborate this issue of centralization a little bit more. I still believe in the idea that uh, major decisions get centralized in times of crisis. It moves toward the center. Now, the center may decide on certain, say, cuts, and then leave it up to the campuses to do it, but nonetheless, the initial decision has, is made at, at the center move. This sets up actual political forces of decentralization when this kind of thing develops. You've got a, you've got a dialectic going on. That you've got both of them going on at, at the same time. Now, the, the, um, the San Francisco move is, of course, part of a larger category of issues of privatization that, that are, are in, the, in the works right now. And some institutions like Michigan and, and uh, Virginia have taken that initiative of privatization whatever it might mean, uh, much more seriously. And I put the San Francisco move, this veiled threat of secession, you might say, that San Francisco made, to be in that category. That the institution is not faring very well, as they say, in a system that involves a taxation in effect of their own uh, resources. And so let's, that can go, it was very veiled. It was very nonspecific in many respects. You see, either just give it, just tinker with the budget and stop punishing us, or we want to go the, we want to go the whole distance and get out. And I think it might have been deliberately veiled because it's a very hot political issue in a, in a, in a, in a system-wide organization. So I would kind of separate the issues a little, little more than you suggested. I would like to thank you, Neil. We would like to thank you, Neil, and we look forward to number three, which will be same time, same place next week. <laughs>